Elon Musk isn't giving up on Twitter, and you know what? Neither should we. As First Amendment freedom of speech loving Americans, it's important that we have that freedom. It's important that we have that town square. And I will say this, if it were Mike Bloomberg or Jeff Bezos offering to buy Twitter, do you think we'd see this kind of reaction? Really from the mainstream media? I think you know the answer to that. I know the answer to that. We're gonna discuss it. Plus, we're gonna get into the business implications here. This is about to get hostile as Musk threatens a tender offer and calls out the board for their lack of common interest with shareholders. We're talking about all of that. Plus, another story I gotta get to today. New video has emerged. It is that Joe Biden said, especially when it comes to Ukraine. It makes you question all of it. Who's running the show? We're going to get into that. Plus, government hypocrisy on full display. What do you know this week? The Democrat leading the defund the police movement has reportedly spent $300,000 on her own private security. $300,000. Wow, we have a lot to discuss today. Welcome, everyone, to the show. It's always great to have you here. I am Trish. A reminder that portions of the Trish Regan Show are brought to you today by Legacy Precious Metals. There has never been a better time to invest in precious metals than right now. So go to LegacyPMInvestments.com, download your free investing guide today. We're going to be talking about recession, the threat of it coming up. There's a new Goldman Sachs warning a little bit later on in the program. But before we do, Elon Musk is single-handedly terrifying the left in this $43 billion offer, $54.20 a share bid for Twitter. He has caused many members of the media to become, oh, I don't know, rather hysterical, shall we say, in their reaction to the mere thought that Elon Musk, a self-described proponent of free speech who believes most speech that's legal and not hate speech should be allowed to exist on a town square style platform like Twitter. In fact, on March 26, Elon tweeted, and I quote, given that Twitter serves as the de facto public town square, failing to adhere to free speech principles fundamentally undermines democracy. Well, you know, I agree with that one. And then, of course, he pronounced that he uh, had purchased 9.2% of the company, which made him the largest shareholder. He has since been reduced to second place because Vanguard upped its stake. But nonetheless, you know, he, he, he has some say. And he's using it, so much so that the, the company is now quite worried as he's expressed an interest in taking over the company, not just taking over. He sent a letter saying, you know, I'm going to pay fifty four twenty a share. They put in what's called a poison pill to prevent him from doing that. He can't acquire more than 15 percent of the company without his stock being diluted. And so uh, this, this is something that, you know, companies do if they're worried that one particular activist investor is trying to take over the company. We'll talk a little bit about the, the economics of that in just a second. But first, on the speech part, think about how fascinating this is and really how telling it is that the mainstream media has reacted the way it has, right? The, this is a guy, Elon Musk, who is clearly, you know, whatever you think about him, clearly innovative, accomplished. He has single-handedly created the electric vehicle industry that the left so loves and wants to take over the world, right? Yet he's been totally demonized by these left-wing extremists, people like, um, well, former Labor Secretary Robert Reich, who's out there on Twitter calling Elon an oligarch. An oligarch, I mean, kind of an insensitive sort of thing to say right now, especially given what's going on in the world, right? To say that about somebody because they, they're an entrepreneur that, that creates something. Um, but this is, this is part of the course. This is what they're doing. Business Insider. This is a liberal business website. It tweeted, and I quote, Elon Musk's attempt to buy Twitter represents a chilling new threat of billionaire trolls taking over social media. Billionaire trolls taking over social media. It is a chilling new threat if Elon Musk gets this company. As far as Business 
insider is concerned today. But interestingly enough, what do you know if you compare and contrast that with what Business Insider said and tweeted back in 2013 when Jeff Bezos, the Amazon billionaire, took over the Washington Post? Well, the publication tweeted this. Billionaire Jeff Bezos' Washington Post buy marks a fascinating cultural transition in America. <laughs> so it's fascinating. It's a cultural transition when Jeff Bezos goes to buy a media company. But if Elon Musk, if Elon Musk does it, then it's somehow a massive threat to our society. I mean, buy as much? Meanwhile, speaking of the Washington Post, which of course is now owned by Amazon billionaire Jeff Bezos, they put out an op-ed column saying that Musk's stake in Twitter was a blow to the quote, equity and accountability at Twitter. So I'm just curious, the columnist here who was so worried about the equity and accountability because there's a billionaire at Twitter, does this person have um, any concern about the billionaire at the Washington Post? No, no. You see, the issue here is, is not the fact that he's a billionaire. The issue is that this is somebody, Elon Musk, who calls himself a free speech abolitionist. And that is absolutely terrifying to some people, especially people that are in control. It's working for them right now, you see? Now, you know, it's not to say that people shouldn't be skeptical of things, right? I mean, I, I'd argue skepticism is extremely healthy, and I would also say that we need a whole lot more of it frankly, in society and on social media today. But what's disturbing is how much the elites, those that are part of the mainstream media circus right now, how much they want to continue controlling the entire narrative. It's the reason why networks like Newsmax or Fox are so threatening. It's the reason why Elon Musk is so threatening, especially when the Twitter platform was doing such a good job at pushing the narrative that the left wanted, right? Especially around the 2020 election as it pertained to Hunter Biden's laptop. Remember, that was not allowed. In fact, New York Post got locked out because of it. Also around COVID, the original goal, keep in mind, of Twitter was to give everyone a, a voice. But the algorithms and the filters involved were being run by people who had agendas. And therein lies the problem. So only the chosen ones get to have a voice in all this. In other words, the political elites have used the platform to advance their cause. And that in and of itself is extremely dangerous to the future of this country and something that Elon Musk has noticed, has articulated, and has picked up on. So as I have said all along, go Elon. I don't know what Twitter would look like under Elon Musk's leadership, but I'll tell you this. He is a brilliant guy. He's an innovative thinker. And we need to find ways to encourage this diversity of speech that matters so much, really and truly, to the future of our nation. As for the business side of all this, well, listen, the stock's been under a heck of a lot of pressure, right? Current management has performed quite poorly, quite poorly in its efforts to monetize Twitter. The shares, they were trading as high as 70 bucks a share back when the company initially announced some of its goals to, to grow its profitability, but it has not been able to live up to those plans. The board has a fiduciary duty to maximize shareholder value, the company's value. Maybe the board thinks it's so worth more without Elon. Maybe they think he'd be disruptive. Maybe he, they think that if he's involved, then somehow everybody leaves. And, and, and the company's worth little then. I mean, they may have their arguments, right? And they've hired Goldman Sachs to help them make their arguments. But I'll tell you this, they've had a lot of opportunity to get the act together there at Twitter and they haven't been able to. They have not been able to. And it makes you wonder, is it because interests are not well aligned? Well, this came up over the weekend, Elon Musk highlighting it, because when you look at the board, when you look at the board, you actually see that, you know, once Jack Dorsey leaves and his, his term's up next month, then people really don't have much of a stake in the company itself. In fact, um, he, Elon Musk, tweeted this and said, you know, basically, heck, you know, I'll save a lot of money just on the board itself. Board salary, he said, quote, will be zero dollars if my bid succeeds. Actually, this was out on Monday. He said he's going to pay him a big fat zero. So there you go. That's about $3 million a year saved right there. 
And like I said, he, he did tweet out that their interests are not very aligned with shareholders and the board owns almost no shares of the company. Jack Dorsey, the former CEO of the company, who, as I said, again, is leaving next month, he agrees. He said, you know, there's been all this drama with the board forever and it's been a big problem for the company for a long time. So bottom line, this is going to be quite a deal to watch. I'll tell you this, Elon could go hostile. He could try to unseat the board. He could try and take the vote to the shareholders. In terms of unseating the board, I should point out the board members are up every year, right? But not all of them, not all at the same time. So they get about nine people on the board that are consistent. So you'd have to get five of them. Three of them come up every year for election. So it could take a little time, but we are, you know, he might get some influence there because we are coming up on the next meeting, which is being held in late May. This could be quite an exciting board meeting, right? And, and, and again, although these, these elections are staggered, it's quite possible that if three board members get voted out, well then, you know, maybe the handwriting's on the wall for the rest of the board. He could also, Elon Musk could also team up with some private equity investors who could buy additional stakes alongside him in the company. Um, look, there, there's a lot of opportunity here, but I will tell you this, regardless of what happens, Twitter is a wake-up call. The company has failed to perform financially. It has failed in its original mission to encourage speech and to allow speech on this town square platform. There is an opportunity for other platforms out there amid chaos. I mean, I just joined Locals, right, which is part of Rumble. And I encourage you, by the way, go over to trishregan.locals.com. Join me over there um, it, it, because there are no algorithms in the way of you getting to see or me being able to put out what I want to point out, trishregan.locals.com. But the reality is this. We do have a problem as a country, and it is critical that we allow more speech, more diversity, more opinion, right? Because otherwise, otherwise then we are no better than China or Russia that's controlling the entire narrative. Turning now to this unbelievable moment from last week, the president was giving a speech and, and just as he finished, he turned to his right and I guess he, he thought he was going to shake hands with someone there, but no one was there. So he, he just kind of wanders. For those of you that are listening, I'm sorry you can't see this because you kind of got to see it to really get it. You can come watch me on Rumble or on YouTube. But anyway, here he is. Let's take a look at the president not knowing what to do for uh, quite some time here. America. God bless you all. Get his back to the audience. I mean, at least look out and smile at everyone, right? Say, hey, you know, great speech. And finally walks off stage. I mean, really unbelievable. It makes you wonder what is going on, for goodness sakes. I mean, I actually felt bad for him in that. How can you not feel bad for him in that? He looks so lost. I mean, just like he did the other day. Remember the other day when Barack Obama came to the White House and Joe was left there turning around in circles looking for somebody to talk to? I thought, okay, maybe he's just trying to be funny here. Maybe he's making a joke, you know, talking about how Obama basically sucks all the oxygen out of the room, right? That's funny. Well, you know what? This is not funny. This is not funny. When you combine this with some of the recent statements he has made and then the White House's immediate effort to take back those statements, it has one, at least me, growing concerned. I mean, first of all, the president said Putin shouldn't be in power. I, I agree, right? Like, I actually thought that was a good speech. No, Vladimir Putin should not be in power in Russia. But apparently you're not allowed to say that stuff if you're Joe Biden. Um, let me share with you the direct quote was, quote, for God's sakes, this man cannot remain in power. Well, White House staffers immediately insisted, you know what, the president wasn't calling for regime change. He was just speaking from his heart. Policy has not changed. Policy has not changed. And then, well, he just uh, doubled down on these faux pas, I guess, because he uh, went on to say that it was, in fact, genocide that is happening right now in Ukraine. And uh, once again, we saw this doubling down from the White House. Oh, no, no, he didn't mean that. You know, like genocide is a legal thing and you've got to actually prove that out. It's hard to prove in, quote, in court. Come on. Come on, guys, wait a second. Like, 
He is the president of the United States of America. Do you go out and correct your boss all the time? Did we see that, by the way, in the last administration or any administration, as long as I've been reporting, right? Where the, where the White House, no, 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 he didn't mean that. He didn't mean that. He didn't mean that. I mean, keep in mind, this is the very same guy, Joe Biden, who said on the 2020 campaign trail that, and I quote, the words of a president matter. Well then, if they matter, shouldn't you know what you're going to say? Why is it that somebody else has to come out and correct them? We need to be asking these questions, which leads me to say, who, who makes these decisions, right? Is it Jen Psaki, who, by the way, good, good, she's going to be out of there. She's not going to be trying to manage his, uh, his talking points anymore. Jen Psaki's going to be leaving, allegedly, to go to MSNBC. Anyway, she'll fit right in. But, <laughs> I mean, who, who's making that decision? Does the State Department, does Anthony Blinken call up Jen and say, Jen, he shouldn't have said that. You got to get this new messaging out there. Who's in charge? Who's making these decisions, who's running the show. I mean, look, I, I think that this is not, I repeat, not a good sign. Not a good sign. Also, not a good sign. It was revealed today that a congressional representative who has advocated for defund the police has actually been spending $300,000 on her own security. Oh, oh, not her money. This is taxpayer money. $300,000. This is all according to a report from Fox. Previously, the lawmaker was asked about why she was spending $70,000. At that time, it was just $70,000 on private security. And I want you to hear her response. I'm going to make sure I have security because I know I have had attempts on my life and I have too much work to do. There are too many people that need help right now for me to, to allow that. So if I end up spending 200000 if I spend 10, 10, 10 more dollars on it, you know what? I get to be here to do the work. So suck it up and defunding the police has to happen. Whoa, 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 we need to defund whoa, whoa, whoa. it. Right, so, so, so suck it up, guys, okay? That's the answer because defund the police has to happen. Doesn't matter if I'm spending $200,000 on security. <laughs> Turns out it's $300,000 apparently on security. But it, it's that kind of response, right? That is so, I think, not going to sit well with everyday Americans. I mean, it's security for thee, but not for me. The danger with this argument is, of course, that they're effectively telling everyday Americans, you know what, you're not worthy of protection. I am. I am because I got this important defund the police thing here to do. I deserve the protection. You do not. And that is so unbelievably wrong. And, and, and frankly, you know, as I look at the, the challenge the left now finds itself in as a political party, very symbolic of all of their issues, right? When you think about the president trying to use a little teeny tiny tax loophole so that he could get out of paying what, like a, a few grand in taxes. Um, and then, you know, saying, no, we got to up taxes for everybody. We're going to up taxes for, it's like, guys, like kind of get your own stuff right, please. The defund the police movement will go down in history, mark my words, as one of the dumbest political movers, maneuvers ever ever engaged in by the left. And I, I think that woman in her commentary really sums it up. Okay, coming up everyone, we're gonna talk about this recession thing because Goldman Sachs, uh, they now have a warning for the Federal Reserve. But first, uh, given all this inflation we've been seeing, eight and a half percent, we saw a massive increase, by the way, in wholesale numbers, the most on record. Uh, I just wanna say, I, I hope you're protected. And I hope as part of that protection, you're looking at investing in gold. I mean, I see gold as one of the best ways, very best ways to hedge all this inflation, of which we have plenty of, and it's not going away. It's, it's really not, and that's going to be part of what I'll, I'll tell you about in a second from Goldman. But it, this inflation is here. And if nothing else, I will tell you this, gold has proven over and over and over again to hold on to its value, right, through thousands of years. And so as our government keeps printing more money, you want something that's going to hold value. The value of our dollars every single day seems to be going down, down, down in terms of purchasing power, right? I mean, 
you think about what you could afford in 1972, this is a very interesting statistic for you. The U.S. dollar has lost 85% of its purchasing power since 1972. In fact, if you look back, what you could buy for 100 bucks back in 1972 actually would cost you $687.81 today. This is a problem. And given the money printing from the fiscal and monetary sides together, it's not going away, which is why you can anticipate a lot more inflation ahead, more inflation in the coming months and in the coming years. So, so do me this favor. It's really important that you protect yourself and you have a diversified portfolio. Part of that portfolio should include gold because it helps to even out that inflation. So when you look to invest in gold, I want you to call my great friends at Legacy Precious Metals. It's the company I trust for investing in gold and in silver. You can call them. I've got the number on the screen if you're watching on video, 1-866-589-0560, 1-866-589-0560. Call them today. Go to their website, Legacy PM Investments. Download the free investing guide there today, LegacyPMInvestments.com. I'll tell you, this inflation is not going away. It is only growing worse, which is part of what the economists at Goldman Sachs are saying now. There's a new note out from Goldman. They're finally saying what I've been saying for months now, and I've been telling you for months now, that the risk of recession is quite real. I actually think my odds are quite higher on this. I think there's more like an 85% chance of a recession, maybe even 95% chance of a recession. It's going to be like a miracle if we don't have one because all the warning signs are there. Anyway, Goldman Sachs now out with a new warning saying that there's a 35% chance of recession in the next two years. Um, and they say that the reason for this is actually the Federal Reserve. Right, you think about, they have to be careful, by the way, they, they can't totally blame Biden. I would say it's combo. It's a combo effect. You get the Federal Reserve and you get the federal government, the Fed's attempt to tackle this massive inflation they believe is going to result in a pullback in the economy. Jan Hatzius, who's the analyst over there at Goldman making these calls, said it's, um, it's a very hard path to a soft landing. Soft landing being, you know, the, the Fed is able to just bring this whole thing in and like everything's going to be fine. Well, how is it all going to be fine? You've got the interest rates going way, way up really, really fast from the Federal Reserve because they're trying to dampen all this inflation that's out there. And yet a lot of these price hikes are going to be kind of baked in. I mean, when was the last time the price for anything went down? <laughs> I mean, can you remember that? Maybe like gas prices, right? Because those change regularly. Maybe even maybe even in some cases you think about home prices, right? And that shocked the market back when that happened. In, uh, in, in 2006, 2007 into 2008, right? It was shocking. It's, it's the reason we had the whole subprime mortgage crisis because home prices never used to go down. They used to go up every single year, almost lockstep with inflation. So it's very rare that prices actually go down. I mean, if you go to a restaurant and you know, the price is X, Y, Z, it's $20 an entree and, and you go back and then it becomes $30 an entree, you think they're gonna send it back down to 20? It very rarely happens. And you've got a situation right now where people have chosen not to go back to work and consequently, employers are gonna to have to pay that much in term, more in terms of wages. I mean, it's really, in effect, the perfect storm. And I, I blame the Federal Reserve along with our lawmakers there on Capitol Hill for this one because you had not one, not two, three COVID stimulus checks. Right, so they're flooding the U.S. economy with all this money. At the same time, the Federal Reserve is out there printing $120 billion a month by buying up mortgage-backed securities and treasuries and doing whatever they can and keeping rates at historic lows. You combine those two things together, you got problems. And by the way, I have been saying this over and over and over again since summer 2020, we are going to have problems. And yet these, uh, you know, these, these geniuses there on Capitol Hill and at the Federal Reserve somehow think all is okay. It'll, it'll be just fine and we can, we can engineer a soft landing. Of course, nobody, nobody predicted they should have, right? Because Joe Biden was supposed to be this wonderful foreign policy expert. They, nobody predicted the conflict we'd now be seeing from Ukraine. So uh, this is why, by the way, a Federal Reserve is not supposed to leave rates at zero for a, an extended period of time. This is why they're not supposed to just be you're flooding the market with $120 billion worth of security buying every single month for, for years on end. This is why. 
And so we are going to have mass inflation. They are going to have to probably overreact with massive hikes that will cause a pull pullback in this overall economy. So um, yeah, it's not good. 35%, listen, Goldman Sachs, I think that's wishful thinking. I wish you were right. Don't forget some of these banks, you know, it's hard for them to actually push this idea of recession because they want to be very careful and cautious. They've got a lot of people that, that don't want them to do that. So there's a little bit of a vested interest in making sure that's not what's talked about. But um, I, I, have no, I have no interest in any of that other than just telling you what I see. And what I see is huge problems ahead because we have printed too much money. And the idea that, that lawmakers on Capitol Hill or that Joe Biden want to print more, I mean, I'm sorry guys, you know what? Remember this, policy matters, economic policy matters, foreign policy matters, it affects everything we do. Do make sure you subscribe to this podcast. I'd love to have you as a subscriber. Do make sure that you go to Apple, iTunes, or Spotify, or both, by the way. You can subscribe to my channels as well on YouTube, Rumbles, Locals, and of course, hey, go to my Twitter account right now. <laughs> In light of all this, we'll see what happens with Elon. I have a feeling it is going to get very, very heated. I'm going to see you right back here tomorrow. Thanks for listening, everyone. Good to see you.